bridge between two countries. On one side is England, on the other I'm in Wales. This is a coast of constant comings and goings, a to and fro of people and ideas that haven't only changed Britain. Events on the Welsh shores have changed the world. Now we're in search of those stories. Miranda's away with the birds. That really is Gannett Central, isn't it? Dick discovers how a sketch in the sand turned into wheels that conquered the world. This is great fun! Tessa meets sisters who sought sanctuary in exile from Africa. I didn't really know that whales existed. Alice tries to rewrite the history of flying. <laughs> Me, I'm on the train that took Welsh Slate around the globe. This is coast and beyond. My destination is the Dee Estuary, the northern border between Wales and England. But my journey starts at their southern border, on the Severn Estuary. This stretch of water has brought great wealth to South Wales. Thanks to the sea, Great cities have grown up. As the people thrived, they've had good reason to be grateful for their coastal connections. But 400 years ago, it was a very different story. At the start of the 17th century, the sea rose up and dashed the people down wiping old villages from the face of the earth. The year is 1607. It's the 30th of January. Unlike today, unseasonal sunshine bathes the estuary. It's a bright start to a disastrous day. Before long, a strong wind whips up. Offshore, huge and mighty hills of water are rolling in set an occlusion course with this coast and its people. Less than five hours, 200 square miles of low-lying land are lost to the sea. Cattle are washed away. 2,000 people are drowned, their lungs filled with salt water. This woodcut depicts the tragedy of biblical proportions. Buildings are inundated, where people climbing trees, others are drowning alongside cattle, sheep and horses. The dead were washed from their graves. To many it must have seemed like the end of days. It was certainly a day that left its mark in people's memories. Here at the church in Redwick, it's commemorated in stone. That dreadful event has been researched by the church organist, Mark Lewis. What evidence is there, Mark, that the church was affected by the flood? Well, we're very fortunate here at Redwick because the height of the flood water was recorded on the wall of the church just after the event. We've got a copper alloy bolt set in lead in this stone on the end of the chancel and the word flood carved above it. And we believe that this is the height of that 1607 event. So the water would have reached my chest? Um, it would have here in the churchyard, but we're on a slight hill. So anywhere in any direction, one or two miles from this would have been under four or five metres of water. The best way to take in the scale of the devastation is from the church tower. 
the flood water covered all the land from the estuary as far as the eye can see up to the New Southern Crossing and as far as the foothills at the Fen Edge which from here is about two or three miles distant inland. Most of the houses in 1607 were timber framed and wattle and daub and they were swept away or washed away. How did people interpret the disaster? This was very much seen as a warning from heaven uh, against vice. Four hundred years ago, the Great Flood was blamed on divine judgment. Today, the widely accepted theory is that terrible weather whipped up the sea, creating a storm surge of water. But this man has a different idea. Professor Simon Hazlitt from the University of Wales believes this coast contains a warning to us and to future generations. What do you think caused the Great Flood of 1607? Well, a lot of people think it was caused by a storm surge, but contemporary accounts that I've read indicate that the weather was fine. It was The day was fairly and brightly spread. So if it wasn't a storm, we've got to look for other explanations. And one of those explanations is possibly a tsunami, which we're now considering. A tsunami? In Britain? Well, yes. <laughs> How, how do you define the tsunami? Well, a tsunami is a long wave, which means that um, from the front of the wave to the back of the wave, it could be several kilometers long. And if it was stood in that wave at the beach when it arrived, it would take 15 to 20 minutes for that single wave to pass, pass over you. That's how big a tsunami is. Somewhere out there in the Atlantic, according to our tsunami theory, there was either an earthquake or an undersea landslide, or maybe both, because earthquakes can trigger undersea landslides as well. They're one of the most energetic phenomena we have in nature, and they contain far more energy than a normal storm wave would have, for example. According to Simon's theory, in 1607, the flood water didn't rise gradually. Instead, a single huge wave smashed into this shore with incredible intensity. A sudden explosion of energy unleashed by an offshore earthquake or landslide. A tsunami's terrifying force can toss huge boulders around with ease. And they've been stacked up like dominoes. The only thing that can really move um, boulders like that is a tsunami. And that's seen right around the world where tsunami have been encountered. So about a five meter high wave and it would have been sloshing against that cliff for about 10 to 15 minutes as the crest of the tsunami passed. All that time bringing in boulders and laying them down in the fabric that we see them here today. The Great Flood of 1607 leveled villages and left 2,000 dead. Was the cause a tsunami triggered by an Atlantic earthquake? Certainly, on the other side of the ocean, the Americans have sunk millions into an early warning system. It's designed to protect their eastern coast from tsunamis set off by earthquakes. The likelihood of such an event in our lifetime is remote. But Simon thinks that shouldn't stop us planning for the worst. Tsunamis are not a regular hazard here in the, in the Atlantic, um, but they do occur. So we need to be mindful of them. And for a very small investment, we could put out in the Atlantic, as the Americans are doing now on their eastern coastline, we could put tsunami warning systems out there. Then if we do have one of these freak events, we will at least have some warning time to get people out of the way. The sea has a terrifying power and beguiling beauty. We've reached the majestic Gower Peninsula. Beyond Gower is Berry Port. When Amelia Earhart landed here in 1928, she became the first woman to fly over the Atlantic. But 
years earlier, could the Welsh cliffs have witnessed the world's very first power flight? We are heading for a town which may deserve a special place on the aviation map, Saundersfoot. An unlikely aviator has Alice in trees. At the end of the 19th century, here in Saundersfoot, a local carpenter claimed that he'd built his own flying machine. And this is the man. His name was Bill Frost, and he said that he built his contraption out of canvas and that he got him airborne and he flew for 500 yards. And he said that he made this flight in 1896, that's seven years before the Wright brothers. So should it be Bill Frost's name in the record books as the engineer of the first powered flight, or is that just a lot of hot air? Supposedly, the scene of Bill's great escape from gravity was this hillside high above Saundersfoot Harbour. Had you been here in September 1896, you might have caught sight of Bill Frost in his flying machine actually flying over this field. <laughs> It was a bizarre thing, part balloon, part glider, part helicopter. There were no witnesses though to back up Bill's story about his flight. He said it came to a crashing end when his craft got tangled in a tree. The next morning the headlines were all about the weather. It says here the great storm and describes a tremendous windstorm sweeping over South Wales and Bill Frost said that his flying machine, trapped in those trees, was torn apart. There's no proof for Bill Frost's claim that he made this flight seven years before the Wright brothers, but could he have been telling the truth? We do know that two years earlier, in 1894, Bill registered this patent for a flying machine. But even if he had made this aircraft, would it have worked? Scientist Mike Bullivant has cast a critical eye over Bill's design. The aircraft comprises an upper chamber filled with a non-specified gas, which is lighter than air. Suspended underneath is a gondola which takes the pilot. Going up from the gondola through the upper chamber is a propeller which is hand cranked by the pilot. Then the upper chamber has wings sticking out of each side. It's part airship, it's part helicopter, it's part glider. To get his airship airborne, Bill would have needed to fill it with lighter than air gas. The obvious choice today would be helium. But in 1896, it wasn't available. So what gas might Bill have used? I reckon it was hydrogen. I'm going to show you how you can make hydrogen. It's really easy. Bill would have needed to know some chemistry. You can produce hydrogen gas, H2, by adding iron to sulfuric acid. What's the formula of sulfuric acid? H2SO4. Right, so the iron's grabbing the SO4. Yeah. Well, we, the we, H is released. H2 is released, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Bill Frost mm -hmm. could actually... <laughs> Bill Frost could have used iron as, and sulfuric acid as a source of the hydrogen to fill that upper chamber. Even if Bill could have made hydrogen, Using it is very risky. Wow! It's a bomb, flying bomb. And Bill Frost's aircraft would have been a very big flying bomb. To see just how big, I'm going to try to get airborne myself. Thankfully, stunt expert Bob Schofield is filling these balloons with another lighter-than-air gas, helium, which, unlike hydrogen, 
doesn't explain. Doesn't explain blown up to eight feet in diameter. How much gas is inside it? About seven cubic meters. That will lift about a tank of water. Well, I'm 64 kilos. I did 80, fully inflated balloons to get me up to there. That's how big that thing is. And I haven't even got an aircraft around me. It's just me. Yeah. No, that's the issue. Full frost and we've also had all the, the actual aircraft, the, the wood, the canvas. Surely Bill's airship couldn't have contained enough gas to lift off the ground. I've got four big balloons attached, but I'll need four more to get airborne. Ooh. And the weather's against me. I'm slightly concerned because just as Bill Frost had his experiment scuppered by a storm, the wind is whipping up here it's in Sunday, isn't it? From the southwest, yeah. Uh, so. Within minutes, things go from tricky to treacherous. Bill Frost would have had a laugh about it. Yeah. Just lean into that now. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, oh, that's not comfortable. I didn't really want to end up with breaking ribs. No. And it's not just me feeling the strain. That one's all gone, it's leaking, you can see through it, it's frayed through with the wind's got it. Really? But it's been rubbing, yeah. I'm losing gas. You're losing gas. Oh. <laughs> As the wind gets stronger, I get seriously worried. Right, go back into that. Yeah. Well, I think it's time to call it a day, unfortunately. It's, it's your call, really. I'm safe on the ground. You're the one that's... I can't believe a storm has once again put pain into an experiment with flight at Saundersford. <laughs> the curse of Bill Frost. It is the right. curse of Bill Frost. Bill's claim to have flown before the Wright brothers does seem like a tall tale. Explosive gas. Wow. And lots of it. A machine at the mercy of the wind. It may all have been a flight of fancy, but we'll never know for sure. Those who are lucky enough to get off the ground are awarded with great views of the South Wales coast. A stroll along this spectacular shore is enough to satisfy most, but some seek more. My name's Trevor Messiah and I'm a professional climbing instructor. We're at um, a cliff called Mother Carries on this step head in South Pembershire, um, otherwise known as Mother Scaries. I came here to uh, I trained as an outdoor climbing instructor uh, in 1984 and I worked a season here at one of the activity centres and uh, really just fell in love with the place. Sounds a little bit hollow, I'm going to pull that one too hard. It does give you a sense of, of, of what it is to be alive. There's not so much risk in life, everyday life for years, and most climbers, what they're doing is they're grabbing a little piece of, of adventure for themselves. See below you, blue sky, sunny. What would you want to be anywhere else? Toes for a long time. Feet are just starting to hurt a little. Your 
totally focusing that small piece of rock in front of you and you haven't really got time to be taking in you know what's happening with the sea and, 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 and maybe the you know the wind and the swell and the wildlife. I can honestly not imagine how my life would be without climbing. That's got to be one of the best routes in Pembroke, for sure. Woo. I love the coastal environment. You know, it's just an amazing place above the sea, watching the ocean. Oh, it doesn't get much better than that, what a day. vast natural harbour of Milford Haven. Massive tankers come here to unload oil from the North Sea and liquefied natural gas from the Middle East. These ships are the only ones making big journeys to this part of the world. Around eight miles off the coast is the tiny island of Grassholm. Miranda's heading there in search of some global travellers who come to Wales to give birth. Only a handful of people are allowed onto Grassholm Island and today I'm one of the lucky few. I'm helping to monitor the gannet population there and I have to say I'm really quite excited. Grassholm is a remarkable seabird city. In summer, 80,000 birds are crammed onto this tiny clump of rock, barely half a mile across. We're just approaching the island now and the air is just thick with gannets. There are gannets everywhere, you look, just circling. It's like the welcome committee come out. And the island itself looks like somebody poured icing over it, but I know that's gannets and gannet poo, and it's very, very smelly. I'm with RSPB warden Greg Morgan and Steve Vautier of Plymouth University who's studying the birds. Wow. Yeah, that's good. Just amazing. Sheer numbers. Just volume and smell. Uh, it's just a real spectacle. The birds look well and truly at home, but they only arrived here in real numbers about a hundred years ago. The gannets moved into the remains of burrows left by the former residents, puffins. Well, this, you know, what we're looking at here, this is the old uh, puffin colony that used to be here on the island. So these are collapsed puffin burrows? That's right, yeah. And so what caused the collapse? Puffin numbers just got too high here. A succession of winter storms would have just slowly eroded the topsoil and uh, it would have gradually got thinner and thinner and they all start to collapse in on themselves. The puffins' loss was the gannet's gain. This is the perfect spot for them to come and rear their young. The grey ones with the, the white speckles there, the youngsters, you've got some that have still got down on their heads, which are probably about five or six weeks old, and the ones that have lost the down are maybe six or seven, and they're very close to fledging. When do they arrive? Because they're not here all year round, are they? The first adults are probably back in March, uh, and they'll probably be laying eggs in, in April. For the middle of August is probably the peak fledging time, um, and then certainly by by September, most of the adults would have would have gone. Little is known about what the gannets do while they're away from grass home. Steve's research aims to shed some light on their mysterious movements. He's looking to catch up with one particular bird he tagged with a tracking device. Crazy thing, crazy thing they're trying to do. I can't believe they're trying to get one gannet in these thousands that we've got here. He's got it, he's got it. He's got the bird. That was amazing! You did that really quickly. I can't believe it. I've never seen a gannet that close. You only ever see them passing overhead. Love being clean. <laughs> 
Steve is taking off an electronic tag that has recorded where the gannet's been over the past two years. They are so tiny, aren't they? What we can do is use these to track the movements away from the colony in the winter. So the idea is to just kind of piece together that part of the season that we know virtually nothing about. So what sort of information are you finding out about the gannets? The results suggest they winter off Iberia, or had to head down to the west coast of, of Africa, of Mauritania and Senegal. Some slightly put out. Sounds like he's itching to get going, but just one more thing before the bird is ready for its long journey south. This guy is due a weigh in. 2,800. 2,800, so you're nearly three kilos. Wow, and is that a good weight for a gannet? It's about normal, actually, about three kilos is standard. The gannets come and go year on year. Winter in Africa or Spain, and summer in sunny Wales. Now it's time to set this one free so it can wash off and prepare for a big trip from this small island. Just watch its head as it will turn around and try and go with you. Okay. Ready? Yep. Off he goes! Ooh, my eyes off! It's off! Brilliant! Sailing right away! Oh! <laughs> Another satisfied customer. The gannets of Grassholm nest on the edge of Cardigan Bay. The huge sweep of the bay opens our way to West Wales. We're here in search of curious comings and goings. Aberystwyth University is home to a group of scientists making ready for an epic voyage. It's not just far beyond this shore, it's far beyond this world. Those researchers are preparing for an extraterrestrial mission here at Clarack Bay. Once a trip to Mars, if you're put off by the millions of miles and months of travel, then come here to sample the delights of the Red Planet. That's what the scientists do. I'm here to meet Lester War and David Barnes, and of course Bridget the Midget Rover. She's the prototype of a robot that'll look for life on Mars which means Bridget needs to be tested on a makeshift Martian landscape. So what are we doing on a beach in Wales? Yeah, yeah. Well, we don't have all the diversity of, of, of rock features you have on Mars, but we have some key ones. First of all, we've got a nice sort of heavenly beach. Moving further over, we have a nice sort of sandy uh, mixed region. And, and finally, as we go sort of over here, we actually have some rather nice sort of sedimentary regions. Uh, and again, you know, one can imagine we're actually up against the sort of the, the face of, of a, a crater on Mars yeah. and we can get our rover up here, we can take some images. This is the surface of Clarack Bay and this is the surface of Mars. Mars, Wales, Wales, Mars. I can see the similarity. If you're looking for a stand-in for the Red Planet, this bay, just outside Aberystwyth, is one of the best places in Britain. It's an unlikely one-stop shop for a variety of Martian-like landscapes. Is Bridget up to the task of manoeuvring around this tricky terrain? And she's off! She's moving! Okay, now is this full speed or uh, this cruising speed? speed? Yeah, okay. so this is reasonably representative of uh, what the Mars rover will do. Yeah. So, I know it just sounds like it's only question us, but where's the engine? Right. Well, this rover has six motors for drive. Right. And uh, you'll see in here, these are the hubs. And there's a motor in each of these hubs. They're inside here? Inside there. There's yeah. a motor. Yeah, they're very small and they have a gearbox which uh, reduces the, the uh, gear ratio. There's an engine and a gearbox in each hub. That's right. 
amazing. It pivots here to keep the body stable. That's called body posture averaging. Actually, you're really going to handle this lot. Yep. Yeah. So we've designed the system so that we'll cope with rocks up to 30 centimeters high. Bridget must be agile and tough. If she got stuck on Mars, there'd be no one to give her a push. She'd have to haul herself out of trouble. Now how powerful is Bridget? How many Martian horses can she pull? <laughs> I'm pretty sure she could pull you along the beach. Really? It might be an idea if we just stop it here, Nick, and uh, maybe you could have a tug of war with Bridget. We'll see how we go, shall we? No contest. Me against a shopping trolley? I don't know going to win. <laughs> maybe. Right, Bridget, now we're going to find out what you're made of. I think we're going to find out what Nick Crane is made of. <laughs> oh, <you> really? <laughs> we'll see. Well, I hope you don't strangle yourself. I'm digging in. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, off we go. Come on, Dick. Come on! <laughs> so something, she's, oh, she's got a bit of power, hasn't she? Look at those feet! Come on, over the place! What's the matter? He's got no traction! <laughs> okay, Bridget! Okay, Bridget wins, I think! Keep turning her off before I end up in the sea! <laughs> Clarick Bay is an odd starting point for a voyage that will end far away from the Earth. But then, this coast is full of surprises. As we cross the Dovey Estuary, it's all a million miles away from the worries of the wider world. Or so it seems. Then, you reach Tom Van Eye. Here, an old military camp marked the end of a journey for thousands of desperate people. They were driven here by political turmoil, half a world away. Historian Tessa Dunlop is uncovering the story. In October 1972, this remote site, almost overnight, became home to some 3,000 refugees. They'd travelled here from Uganda. They hadn't planned to come to the Welsh coast, but they had no choice. They'd been forced to leave their homes in Africa, homes to which they'd never return. I'm meeting two of those refugees. Chandrika and Madhu are sisters. Some 40 years ago, they were teenagers when they first found themselves on this Welsh beach. It must have been quite something arriving here and seeing the coast. I didn't really know that whales existed. My first impression was it was very calming, very inviting. It was in the middle of autumn, so I felt it was really cold, gloomy. When I first came here and um, you know, saw all the seaweed by the coast. I was just like, oh, what's this? The sisters had arrived in Tonvanai after a grueling 4,000 mile journey from their homeland. Uganda, a country once part of the British Empire, by 1972, it was beset by economic and civil strife. The army officers on the custom department they removed my wristwatch and the ring and so I brought my look goods back from Antibia airport and I could not go. President Idi Amin had given the Asian minority just 90 days to leave the country, accusing them of profiting at the expense of black Ugandans. The Asians had lived in Uganda for generations, originally encouraged to settle by the British during the days of empire. And that is why I said that the responsibility of Asians in Uganda it is the responsibility of Great Britain. Armin's ultimatum to leave Uganda caused panic. British passport offices were besieged by applicants. I'm still waiting for the police high commission to decide what, what about the security and safety of the lives and the goods. 
Amid increasing desperation, some 30,000 Ugandan Asians fled to Britain. The refugees were housed in resettlement centres, 3,000 of them in the former military camp at Ton Van Ay. Chandrika, Madhu and their family arrived at Ton Van Ay's sleepy seaside station, an unlikely contrast to the terror of their expulsion from Africa. What do you actually remember of leaving Uganda? The worst thing was the airport. We were the last family to, uh, to board mm. and uh, I was the last passenger. Mm. And I happened to... Can't do it. Because they were raping women and things like that, my mother was really terrified. And I remember my mother's face was really terrified. Didn't know what to do and they kept on pushing my mum away to say, you leave her with us and you just go. I got a lot of abuse, a lot of aggression. And that is my last memory. And I don't... Yeah. Um, last memory. And yeah. it's not nice. Tom Van Ay Station serviced the military camp that was sited nearby on the coast. It used to be a live firing range. The row of gun emplacements pointing out to sea still runs along the shore. When the Ugandan Asians arrived in 1972, the military were long gone. But camp life soon developed new routines in the buildings they'd left behind. It was like a dormitory with lots of single beds with these um, army type of rough blankets and little electric heater. Which one I call it. you want? <laughs> that was freezing. Only one, right? It's freezing. There were worries about how the new arrivals would cope in the Welsh winter. What do you think it's going to be like for these people in the winter? Well, taking into account they've never experienced cold weather, I should think we would get quite a lot of illness. But the cold wasn't the only concern for the refugees. Elsewhere in the UK, their arrival was provoking bitter hostility. We are now telling the politicians in this country today that we cannot and will not absorb any more. The welcome on the Welsh coast for the Ugandan Asians was warmer. Many of the locals rallied around to help. They were really hospitable, weren't they? Yes. With clothes and things like that. The locals. Know, the, well, the, the, even the camp, the WRVS, etc. had organised warm clothing for us. So then we started getting coats and... Uh, little bits of things like that. It was very well organized as well, you know, there was uh, you know, overnight and the, the place was actually buzzing. In 1972, Anne James was one of the teachers drafted into work at the camp school. There weren't many foreign people around in these parts at all. And it didn't seem to matter about them being of a different culture. In the 38 years since the camp closed, Anne hasn't met any of the Ugandan Asians she helped until today. Yes, I remember you. Oh, my do. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> really lovely seeing you. I, I know I for you. All those years. I lovely. brought a photograph. Have Can I show you? you? <laughs> Goodness me. I remember. That's you? That's me, yeah. Good. You know, in my little short uh, dress. <laughs> <laughs> wow, my... that's wonderful. <laughs> what was it like to teach these girls? Are they good students? Oh, they were great. Very diligent. Wanted to learn. Mm. They were really good. You <laughs> must have been sad when the camp closed down, really. Yes, I was very sad. We all were very sad because, um, and it's closed very quickly. 
In the six months it was open, this abandoned military base, staffed by an army of local volunteers, managed to keep 3,000 refugees warm and well-fed during a Welsh seaside winter. By the time spring arrived in 1973, the last temporary residents were leaving to be resettled around Britain. So what happened to the sisters? I became a radiographer in Cardiff and then I did my uh, masters in Manchester and I'm a CT superintendent now. Wow, impressive stuff. What about you, Chandri? I became a dentist and I'm a specialist in special care dentistry and uh, I work around Cardiff and uh, love it. <laughs> The west coast of Wales can boast one of Britain's great railway routes. It runs right beside the sea and over it. At Porth Maddock, the coastal railway connects with another train line that links the sea to the hills of Snowdonia. The peaks are a rich source of slate. That Welsh slate was once sought after the world over. A journey that began by train. This line was built to bring slate from mountain quarries to supply the Castillo Wind train from Lyon down to the harbour of Port Marrow, where I'm heading. Started in 1832, the Festiniog Railway is the world's oldest independent railway company. Nowadays, the trains haul tourists, an operation that runs thanks to volunteers who give up their time for the love of steam. It's not hard to see why. What's the fireman's job, Jeremy? Well, think of it like this, Nick. There's two parts to it. There's the engine part, which is Carl's job, and there's the boiler part, which is my job. So I've got to keep the needle up there, which is the steam pressure gauge on the boiler, somewhere between about 145 and 155, and I've got to keep the water in the boiler as well. And what's your job in real life? Me? I'm a technologist in real life. <laughs> I'm a technology strategist for Microsoft. <laughs> stop on the line is Porth Maddock. Today, this picturesque coastal town sells itself as the gateway inland to Snowdonia. But once, this place looked out to sea. Porth Maddock was a gateway to the world. The slate which came down from quarries inland left here on vessels bound for the Mediterranean, the Baltic and Canada. Just look at this photograph from the 1870s. It shows a forest of rigging. This port was absolutely packed with ships. The boats were built to carry heavy loads of slate. Without that weighty cargo, they became unstable. So for their return journey from far-flung parts, the skippers loaded foreign rocks as ballast. That huge mound over there is made up of stones from all over the world. Ballast that was discarded to create an artificial island. 
a man-made reef, piled up piece by piece with rocks from Australia and America. A reminder of the ebb and flow of trade to and from our shores. But we're heading along the Welsh coast, out to Bardsey Island. Bardsey isn't very big, but for some it's their entire world. One fortunate family lives on this island full time, and the porters school their children at home. For months on end, youngsters Ben and Rachel have Bardsey to themselves. Their closest friends, a ferry ride away. I'm Rachel, Rachel Porter, and I live on Bardsey Island. <laughs> I'm Ben Porter. We moved here two years ago. Uh, we were very excited about coming to live here. Um, obviously miss the friends and things. We do have a lot more freedom here. Um, mainly because we don't, there aren't the dangers of being on the mainland. There aren't, there's no traffic, you know, there aren't any, any people we don't know. I like um, bird watching and other animals and wildlife. I do a lot of art and I go for lots of sketching walks. I take my sketchbook with me and sketch the wildlife and the birds and stuff like that. I really enjoy it. Every day does feel different. <laughs> Never been bored. No. Obviously, <laughs> there's a limit to how much you, ex you can explore here. But I don't feel like I'm missing out on much, really. My friends come for a week or two um, in the summer or in the spring. I'm not sure how, how well they'd fit in if they lived here, though. <laughs> I might miss a few things. We go back to the mainland about three times a year. It's good to go back and see everyone. But at the end of the few days, because it's so chock full of shopping and seeing people, you're so tired that yeah, it's good to get back again. On our journey around the Welsh coast, we're following a route well travelled by pilgrims seeking spiritual solace. Isolation has always been sought by those needing space to think. A very big idea was conceived in the quiet of Red Wharf Bay. In 1947, one visitor here came up with a notion that would change the world of motoring. A vehicle dreamt up on this beach would kick-start the British car industry after the turmoil of war. Dick Strawbridge is going back in time. It's Easter 1947 and two brothers are on holiday here. They stop so one can draw a sketch in the sand of an idea he's been working on. It's for a novel vehicle. Starts off with a very conventional rear axle. There's two wheels here. The back wheels connect to a box that also drives the front axle. So, four wheel drive. The concept was a cross between truck and tractor. Nobody knows what the original sketch looked like, and mine may be a bit ropey, but this is the basis of a utility vehicle that conquered the world. The Land Rover. The man who drew that blueprint on the Welsh sand dunes was chief designer at the Rover Car Company, Morris Wilkes. Since its conception in 1947, the Land Rover's been seen in every far-flung part of the globe in the toughest terrain. Now we're bringing one of the very first back home to the beach where it all began.
to understand the secrets of its success, we have to take the skin off and get down to the nuts and bolts to see what makes this tough guy tick. Ready? I'm stripping away the Land Rover's bodywork to reveal the design that Wilkes sketched in the sand some 60 years ago. I could hardly have a better model to study. So how old is this vehicle? Which one is it? This is uh, pre-production number 16. Prototype 16? Yeah. So there's only 15 older Land Rovers in this one? Yes. And you're letting us take it apart. Most modern cars need a fancy toolkit and plenty of time to strip down. Not this one. It's amazing. It's nearly taken apart. A couple of spanners, and that's all the bits. It's so simple, it's great. Over two million Land Rovers have been sold worldwide. But when Morris Wilkes drew up his design, the plan was for a quick fix, a runabout, to get his business through the post-war slump. In 1947, Britain was almost bankrupt. Steel was in short supply. So the Land Rover's bodywork was made from aluminium. Just one of Wilkes' many bright ideas. Testing the Land Rover was a family affair. Morris Wilkes came to the beach with his children to put the prototypes through their paces. To see what Wilkes came up with, we're stripping the skin off one of his early models. But what about the man himself? What made the car's creator, Morris Wilkes, tick? I'm with his son Stephen in a car he rode in with his dad. This is Land Rover number one, the vehicle that started it all. An adventure that began on family holidays some 60 years ago. We've come down onto the sand, play in the sand, play in the sea, and then back into the Land Rover and back up to the hotel. Do you remember the trials? Yeah, well, uh, it was over dunes, it was over hillocks, it was through uh, wet ground, it was through the sea itself sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah it was smashing up everywhere. As a youngster growing up, it must have been a very exciting time with all these inventions and ideas. Yeah, well, Dad was always interested in something. You know, I mean, it might be astronomy, or it, uh, it could be electrical things. But uh, he really uh, developed a vehicle that was useful for him. He felt there was a need to have a vehicle that would uh, do more than just what a car would do. It would be a farmer's vehicle, as well as being something which would be useful for um, the more sort of general public. The first time the public saw the Land Rover was at the Amsterdam Motor Show in 1948. And it was a big hit. By 1959, a quarter of a million had been sold. At the peak of its popularity, over 50,000 Land Rovers a year were produced. Early on, Canny Morris Wilkes had his sights set on the military market. By testing his new vehicle on the beach, he showed the British Army it could cope with desert conditions. During the trials, Morris fine-tuned the Land Rover's design, stripping it back to basics, just as we've done with our early example. There you go. With the bodywork removed, the genius of Wilkes' design is laid bare, starting with a strong box chassis. It gave the vehicle great stability over all terrain, and the chassis was complemented by another innovation, permanent four-wheel drive. Four-wheel drive means the power from the engine goes to all four wheels all the time, which means it's really difficult to get stuck. also a do-anything vehicle. We're talking drivability and practicality. Here we've got a power takeoff, which means that farmers could drive agricultural machinery. The 
the Land Rover wasn't just perfected on this beach, it was born here. On the day in 1947 that Morris Wilkes drew his sketch in the sand. Skirting North Wales, we're on the final leg of our tour to discover the curious comings and goings on this coast. For thousands of years, copper from the Great Orm was sent around Britain and beyond. Later, human cargo came in at Clandudno Pier. Tourist boats bringing visitors on Kiss Me Quick adventures. All along this poor shore, there's been a constant toing and froing. But at our final stop on the DS Curie, it's another story. You find something that's not going anywhere. Many people making their way along this shore must have wondered what on earth is going on with this ship. But very few get this close. She sat on this site since 1979. Remember the 70s? Life was somewhat slower paced, especially on Sunday. Shopping on the Sabbath was seen as something of a sin. For retailers, every seventh day was an opportunity going begging. But did it have to be? I just happen to have here a copy of the Shops Act 1950. The provisions of this act used to forbid most shops from trading on a Sunday. But maybe there was a loophole. It says here in part 4, section 56, subsection 6, the foregoing provisions of this part of the sack shall not apply to any seagoing ship. So perhaps if you got yourself a ship and set it up as a shop, you could open a Sunday. So the Duke of Lancaster found herself being towed into place in August 1979 to become a visitor attraction and a shopping centre. Alan Darcy didn't just work on board, the ship was his home. Follow me, Nick. It's quite eerie, isn't it? It is, yeah. Feels like uh, a ghost ship. What used to happen in here? This is the market deck area. All the traders rent so much space to sell the wares. Yeah. And um, this is where they'd be. The traders moved on years ago, but the ship is stuck in the past. Following a series of planning disputes, this shop on the sea ceased trading. But those who love this old girl can't let go. the Dolphin Restaurant, Nick. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. It takes you back, doesn't it? I actually had my wedding reception in here. In here? In here, yeah. In uh, 1982. What did it look like? Like a Titanic, for the ones who are aware of it. You've got a bit here with all the um, tablecloths on and waitresses and food and people jollying. Beer and champagne, you know, it's just, just like that. It's just crying out for happy people. Help. <laughs> help. It is crying out yeah. for help. It is sad that yeah. she, she sat here empty. I'd like to have seen her still open and working instead of just sitting here waiting for something to happen to her. 
it's become part of your life, hasn't it? It, it has, yeah. I did get a little bit emotional, but we just have to wait and see what happens to her. Well, that's because it's tied up in your life, you see. Ships aren't just lumps of metal. No, yeah. no. They have lives and tied names. in them. Yeah. Lives and names. This is one of the most bizarre sights I've seen anywhere on the British coast. A great white beached whale. Coast does everything on a grand scale. Its scenery, its wildlife, its spirit of enterprise and adventure, the ideas of ebb and flow with every age. These shores have always been a window on a wider world, on far horizons. Oh, and there's one other thing, they're very welcoming too. I'll be back.